Uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, health and illness are very important topics for each uh, one of us. Some of you might know that in recent years, uh, I have become much more focused on health and how nutrition plays a big part in, uh, in this. For me, living until I'm uh, my mid 80s and still having a full and active life, working, traveling, hanging out with friends, swimming and riding my bike, out with friends, swimming and riding my bike again. Now, this is something that interests me and uh, probably many of you too. So it is with special excitement that I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Paul Clayton to our gathering tonight. Dr. Clayton is going to demystify why public health Oh, sorry, I have to let some people in. So Dr. Clayton is going to demystify why public health is declining, why the so-called diseases of civilizations are increasing and occurring in progressively younger groups of people, why waistlines are expanding, intelligence and fertility are falling, and prospects for the next generation look bleak. Dr. Clayton is a clinical pharmacologist and pharmaconutritionist, and he states, I obsess about food, nutrition, and health so that you don't have to. He works with leading doctors and clinical scientists at centers of clinical expertise in many countries, designing and supervising preclinical and clinical trials of pharmaconutritional interventions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Clayton. So I will mute. Okay, so now can you hear me? I assume you can hear me. I have no idea if you can or not. Okay, Michaela, I think you're telling me that, I, that you can, so good. Um, so Dona mentioned the idea that we have problems with diseases of civilization. It's not a new idea. This was really started by um, a man called Barry Popkins a scientist, he's an agricultural economist, and he was then, he still is, at the Carolina Population Center. And he coined the phrase nutrition transition. And what that describes is what has happened in different countries that have left their traditional diets behind and have started to eat a modern diet. And by modern, I mean processed and ultra processed. And what he recorded in every country which has done this is that people got heavier, and the frequency of chronic degenerative diseases increased and their latency decreased. So we saw more people with cancer, with diabetes, with Alzheimer's, and the people were developing these diseases younger than ever before. And these diseases became known as diseases of civilization, which is accurate in some respects, but it's not very helpful because although it has a kind of poetic resonance, it's not sufficiently detailed to allow us to design antidotes. So for the last 20 or 25 years, I have been looking at the ways in which the modern diet and lifestyle make us sick and trying to develop ways to take us back to a much healthier point in our history when we were still eating traditional foods. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. So I'm going to share the screen with you and hopefully what this will do is it will bring up my slides. And I hope you can see these slides in full screen. Do you have them in full screen? I think you do. So the title of my talk is Diet, Disease and Doctors. And diet and disease are very uh, intimately related Doctors less so, and I'll try and explain why that is. To begin with, I think the main point I want to make is that the medical system in its current shape has failed. It's failed really badly, because even although we have many drugs that we can use 
to treat uh, the symptoms of disease. And we do that quite well, in fact. Um, none of the drugs that we have is able to cure any of the generative diseases. And in fact, our public health has gone from bad to worse. And I'll show you a few statistics from different countries to illustrate that point. We'll start with Australia, uh, which you might think of as a fairly healthy country, but according to the government statistics, these are the government's own statistics, and if anything, I think they're underestimates. About a half of all adult Australians have a chronic degenerative disease and about a quarter have two of them. And if we go all the way around to the other side of the globe and go to Denmark, two out of three adult Danes have got a chronic health condition. This is not uh, a healthy situation at all. And if you look at the way in which the frequency of this disease is increased with age, I'm not sure if you can see the whole screen, but in the group 16 to 44, they average about one chronic condition each, but in older groups, you see progressively more. And this reflects what we typically see in public health. As people get older, they become sicker and they develop more, the symptoms of more degenerative conditions. The United States is exceptional in many ways. Um, but almost two thirds of all American adults have clinical chronic disease, about 40% uh, of two. And if you look at older adults, most of them, the majority of them have the symptoms of three or more chronic degenerative diseases and the trends are all negative. Everything's going from bad to worse. And so that's why I say the medical system has failed. We're good at treating the symptoms of diseases. We can't cure those diseases. And in, in the background, it, the public health is absolutely terrible because we have nothing that works prophylactically or preventatively. This is one of the reasons why, because all of us are getting heavier. And part of the reasons for that is that we're physically very inactive. We have motor cars and we have information technology. So we simply don't work, do as much physical work as they did even two or three generations ago. And because we're given access to a wide range of ultra processed foods, which are stuffed full of calories, but which don't contain very many of the things that reduce our appetite. So we end up eating too many of them and many of those calories are empty. And because we're getting heavier, we see more and more diabetes and sleep apnea and heart failure and hypertension. All these diseases become more common as we get heavier, but just sticking with type two diabetes, that's NIDDM, non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, that's the top row there. As we get heavier, we become more at risk. And this is an example of a disease that has become much, much more prevalent. Um, when I went to medical school in 1968, it was not that common and it was a disease of old age. So in the space of a mere 60 years, this disease has become overwhelmingly common, now affecting more than about approximately two thirds of all adults in the United States, if you add this up to metabolic syndrome. And it's no longer a disease of old age. We see it presenting in patients in their 30s, 20s, teens and even in their preteens. It represents an acceleration of the aging process and it actually represents a culture where most of us are being chronically poisoned. Now since 1950, overweight, obesity and diabetes have doubled every 10 to 15 years or so. And the problem with that is, is once you're diagnosed as a diabetic, you lose between six and eight years of life expectancy because as I said, it represents an acceleration of the aging process. And so conditions related to diabetes are increasing too. Non-alcohol related fatty liver disease, end stage renal disease, these are complications of diabetes and they're absolutely out of control. Uh, they affect countless millions in the United States and increasingly worldwide. Hypertension now affecting about almost two thirds of all American adults. If you add preclinical hypertension into that, it's almost three quarters. This is a sick, sick society. And because the diabetics is more at risk of cataracts, it's a minor complication of diabetes. And because people are becoming diabetic at earlier ages, people are developing cataracts at an earlier age. Um, I just need to know, um, this screen seems to be oversized. And so I don't see my entire slides here. Doina, can you just put up your hand if you can see the whole slide or if part of the slide is spilling off the screen? Can you see the whole slide, yes or no? No, it's cut at the right uh, end, on the, on the right side. Okay, then if I do it this way, can you see those slides now? Uh, yeah. Okay, I think we'll have to do that because for some reason, um, my laptop is distorting the slides. 
Um, so dementias, which are also uh, increased in risk in diabetics since 1950, they've increased by 250%. And the average age of dementia, just as diabetes is occurring in younger and younger patients, the average onset of dementia is now much younger than it used to be. It's fallen 15 years since 1980. And because we can treat some of the symptoms of dementia, not very effectively, uh, dementia generally gets worse and it generally eventually will kill or the neurodegenerative diseases will. So in the over 75 year olds, the deaths have increased 300% in men and 500% in women. And this is going to get even worse. It's already a huge burden on our health systems because depression is increasing and depression is a risk factor for dementia. Uh, and dementia is increasing, but that depression, which is driving it, one of the factors driving it is doubling with each generation. And the age of onset has fallen by 16 years. Uh, even since 1988. So this is a picture of a society that is becoming increasingly vulnerable to a whole range of different diseases. And I'll quickly go through more of these to show you how widespread that pattern is. It's not just our central nervous systems in old age that are being damaged, but they're being damaged uh, in the early years of life as well. So that what you would think of as the spectrum disorders, all of those have increased very, very considerably. Uh, for reasons which are actually very similar to those which are causing neurodegenerative disease. And I'll come back to that later. If I move to a different group of diseases, diseases affecting the musculoskeletal system, our bones are becoming more fragile. Our cartilage in hips, knees, and elsewhere appears to be degenerating as well. And then jumping across to diseases involving the immune system, asthma, is increased really dramatically all over the world, but it's not just asthma, all of the other allergies, including those affecting the gastrointestinal tract, not particularly well known, but they're increasing again, hugely significantly, as are the autoimmune diseases. And there's about a hundred of those. They're all very interesting, they're pretty awful if you have one of them, uh, difficult to manage, and they are all increasing as well, as are the cancers. I could go on. It's a general pattern. And so since 1950, you can see that non-tobacco related cancers have approximately doubled per 100,000 of population. Lung non-tobacco related cancer, lung cancer has doubled since 2012, an extremely rapid rate of increase. This is not because we're getting older as a society, uh, because you can see here that this affects young people as well. Cancer in younger adults and in teenagers has doubled. And one of these cancers, bowel cancer in the age range 22 to 37, which is young for cancer, that group has quadrupled in size since 1974. So there's a lot of red flags here, a lot of signs that our aging process is being accelerated by the way in which we live and that our health is being progressively severely damaged. It's even worse than you might think because even if you don't already have a clinical disease, all of those conditions that I've mentioned have long le le uh, lag phases. In other words, they develop slowly under the surface before they get to the point where they're significant enough to cause clinical symptoms, which is quite late in the disease in many cases. And that's when you go and see the doctor, which is a problem for the doctor because they usually only ever get to the scene of the crime far too late after a great deal of damage has been done. It takes years for for example, non-alcohol related fatty liver disease to get to the point where it's causing cirrhosis and then moving perhaps if you're unlucky towards liver cancer. So when you look at a group of so-called healthy young adults, you see that a lot of them, about at least one in five, are already developing that kind of liver disease. They're moving towards clinical illness. Um, about a quarter are moving towards osteoporosis, at least a fifth of non-diabetic people are moving towards their first heart attack and hypertension. Um, considering the number of people who are diabetic, the overall fraction in the population is more like 40%. About a fifth of healthy middle-aged adults are starting to dement if you use sufficiently sensitive tools to pick up the beginnings of that condition. And almost a half of adults in what should be at the peak of your health, 40 to 49, are becoming frail. They're developing um, not just bone weakness, but also muscle weakness. They're losing muscle mass and strength. They are starting to move towards diabetes, metabolic disease, and a whole range of other complications. Now, you might think that this is just part and parcel of getting old. It isn't. 
And we know that because when we look at vestigial groups, that is people who still live hunter gatherer types of lives and who eat very traditional diets, they don't age in the way that we do. So if one of them dies in an accident and we look inside their coronary arteries, we don't see any signs of developing coronary artery disease, which we do when we look at people who are growing up in New York or Toronto. And as the, in these young vestigials, as they get older, they don't age in the way that we do because their blood pressure doesn't rise as they get older. They don't develop obesity as they get older. They don't develop insulin sensitivity. Their bones as a whole do not get more fragile. What I'm trying to tell you is that a lot of the symptoms of aging, things that you think of as an essential part of the aging process, they're nothing to do with aging per se at all. They are in fact signs of chronic intoxication and that is very much a problem caused by our diet and lifestyle. And it's this same damage is showing up in our intelligence because the brain is a very delicate organ. It has many nutritional requirements which we are clearly not meeting. This is a meta-analysis looking at the results of many many different studies of intelligence over time. Uh, a rather good paper this and it shows that since 1950 between then and 2020, over a period of 70 years, average IQ has fallen by the equivalent of 15 points. We genuinely are getting less intelligent. And I would worry about our children and our children's children if we continue down this road. But perhaps we won't have any because, well, sperm counts are falling catastrophically almost everywhere almost two thirds, and this again is a meta-analysis looking at studies which have been conducted in many countries all around the world. We are seeing more men who are subclinically fertile or who have frank infertility. And one of the reasons behind this is that their testosterone levels are falling catastrophically, but there are other problems as well. So this is a, a really bad situation. And all of these problems are now acknowledged to be being caused by the postmodern diet. Now, this is huge data here, big numbers that are being crunched by people who specialize in this sort of thing. And they come to the conclusion every year that the most important cause of premature aging, degenerative disease, and early death is poor diet. Well, how does our poor diet damage us? Let me see if I can get this slide to move on. Well, it causes chronic inflammation. Here's a, a cartoon of that. It's a little bit complicated, so I'll give you a simpler one. That twin line across the top of the picture is your cell membrane. And for those of you who've done biology, you'll recognize it. It's the typical phospholipid bilayer. And this shows you why you need to have inflammation, but you mustn't have too much. Your inflammatory response is a way in which we defend ourselves against bacterial invasion or physical trauma. So that's your challenge up there in the top left, that lightning bolt. When that challenge arrives, you have to create an inflammatory response to neutralize it. And to do that, we use arachidonic acid, which is an omega-6 fatty acid from plant oils that is built into the cell membranes. That breaks down and forms messenger substances which drive the inflammatory reaction. And once they've disabled or destroyed the microbe or removed all of the damaged tissue, then you need to stop the inflammation so that peace can return and you can heal and regenerate and repair. And we do that with omega-3 fatty acids, typically from seafoods over on the right, EPA and DHA, and they produce compounds which stop the inflammation and allow it to resolve. Now you're constantly being presented with inflammatory challenges. So you're constantly having to switch on the inflammatory sequence. And really you should be constantly switching it off when each challenge is neutralized. You can think of the, uh, the omega-6s over on the left as the accelerator on a car, the omega-3s on the right as a brake. And just as you need both an accelerator and a brake to negotiate the heavy traffic of Toronto, you need to have both the sixes and the threes in the right proportion to negotiate and to deal with the challenges that are presented to you every day that you're alive. Here's another way of looking at it. The inflammasome, it's got two chambers. And in the upper chamber, it's all about the ratio between the omega-6 and the omega-3 fatty acids, just as we saw in this previous slide. Now the immune cells are constantly shedding exosomes. These are little particles that used to be called cell dust but now we know they're not dust at all. They're little 
packages containing all kinds of information and messages to other cells around the immune cells. Now your immune cells are constantly shedding these and they contain enzymes called matrix metalloproteases, which are very destructive. Now, if you have the right six to three ratio, then the exosomes won't contain very many of these enzymes. And if you're eating a healthy diet as well, which is full of polyphenols, the pre-transitional diet, the traditional diet always used to, then you have a healthy balanced system. This represents a system that can create inflammation when necessary to respond to a challenge, but then switches it off again before too much tissue damage has been created. This is where the modern diet harms us. First of all, it gives us a six to three ratio in our foods and therefore in our cell membranes, which is far too high. Far enough plant oils in our diet and not enough seafoods. So that means that your immune cells are shedding exosomes, which contain lots of these destructive matrix metalloprotease enzymes. You'd still be okay, probably, if you were eating a traditional diet with lots of polyphenols. But this is the next thing the modern diet does, is it removes the polyphenols. So too high a 6 to 3 ratio means the top chamber is overheating. When the polyphenols go, the lower chamber is overheating as well. And your immune cells are now releasing huge amounts of matrix metalloproteases, far more than they should, far more than they need to, and they are destroying the extracellular matrix. And that's what the matrix looks like. It's a three-dimensional mesh of microfibers that runs through every cubic micrometer of your body, holding all your cells together in the correct orientation so that they can communicate with each other and coordinate and act collectively. It's your soft skeleton. And collagen is one of the fibers. Actually, there's nine or 10 different types of collagen, but there's many other fibers as well, which is why there's no point in drinking collagen to improve your skin texture. You need much more than collagen. You need elastin, laminectin, proteoglycans, glycosine amino glycans, the list goes on and on. A very complex structure. It's different in different parts of the body, depending on what it has to do, whether it has to be, has to have more strength, tensile strength in some areas, in some areas it has to be more elastic. In some areas, hydration capacity is more important. And so this matrix actually differs. It's a bit like a tapestry in different parts of the body. But the matrix metalloprotease enzymes that are being released when you have too much inflammation, chronic inflammation, they destroy all of these fibers. And basically, you dissolve because without these microfibers holding your cells together, they drift apart and they disintegrate. These are the same enzymes released by the so-called flesh eating bacteria. And this is what happens when you're exposed to large amounts of these incredibly destructive enzymes in a short period of time, they dissolve everything. It is those same enzymes being released in much smaller amounts over much longer periods of time that lead to the slow disintegration of tissues such as bone or cartilage or arterial walls that is the hallmark of chronic degenerative disease. And the problem is that our six to three ratio, which has probably been one to one or two to one for most of history, has increased dramatically. So that now in Europe, the average is now 15 to one. In North America, it's 25 to one. And our polyphenol intakes have fallen by 90%. Again, thanks to the manufacturers of processed foods. The reason why there is such a problem, and I think what I'm going to try to do is to go back to full screen at this point. Oh, Lord. Sorry, bear with me. Now, do you have this full screen? Yep. Okay, so these are all the companies that you know and love, and they're the people who make these junk processed foods that are killing all of you, basically. Um, None of these foods are toxic acutely or individually, but if you eat too many of them, they will make you sick and they will kill you because they create chronic inflammation, dysbiosis, and type B malnutrition. Because in these types of foods, the six to three ratio is far too high and the polyphenols have gone. So you have a lot of chronic inflammation. And then the manufacturers take out these compounds, which are also very important anti-inflammatory agents, and they replace them with very pro-inflammatory compounds. I don't know what's the matter with this screen. I'm going to try an experiment. Please bear with me for a moment. This might solve the problem. No, sure, take your time, <laughs> please. Yes, I do apologize. Let me see, if this, is this any better? Yes. yes. 
<laughs> yes, it is. I'm sorry. You know, you know what it is? I've bolted on an extra screen to my laptop, which helps me to work, but obviously it's damaging PowerPoint. So yes, the food companies have taken out these four very important anti-inflammatory compounds. They've replaced them with these three compounds, which are very pro-inflammatory. So of course we have far too much chronic inflammation. And then they stuff our foods full of plant oils and sugar and lots of empty calories. So we get fat. And because the calories are empty, they cause type B malnutrition. We are low in everything apart from calories. And these two things combine to make us very, very sick indeed. They are stuffing us with sugar, which is in all kinds of unlikely places. This is a diet which creates chronic inflammation, dysbiosis, type B malnutrition. Now what's type B malnutrition? Type A malnutrition is your typical medical textbook sort of situation where people are starving because they don't have enough food. That's that kind of malnutrition. That's not what we see today. We see type B malnutrition where people have enough or too many calories, but they're low in many vitamins, trace elements, methyl donors, cyanogens, carotenoids, xanthophils, polyphenols, the list goes on and on and on. They're low in everything. And we know what they look like. They look like this. These young kids, if they're eating hamburgers and shakes and fries and Cokes and sort of terrible foods like that, they have chronic inflammation. They have type B malnutrition. And that is why when we look at these children carefully using very powerful investigative techniques, we find that the majority of them already have in their bodies the early signs of those chronic diseases, which will eventually grow and become more significant and come to the surface, cause clinical symptoms, and years from now be diagnosed. But they're already dying, these children, and they don't even know it. We know that the more of these ultra processed foods you eat, the heavier you get because they're full of calories and they do not contain the ingredients which you need to stop you from overeating. The more you eat, the heavier you get, which creates another paradox. The people who are at the very heaviest have the worst nutrition because they are eating the most empty calories, which is why the more of these ultra processed foods you eat, the more you die. Every 10% increase in consumption of these ultra processed foods increases the risk of cancer, diabetes, early death. And the more of them you eat, the more you die. And it also accelerates the rate at which your immune system ages, increases inflammation, increases the risk of sepsis. And now I have to admit this last study done by Napier et al in 2019 is not in humans, it's done with lab rats because guess what? Lab rats love these junk foods just as much as we do. They will eat as much of them as they can. And the more they eat, the more they get sick and the more they die as well. And because we eat so many of these foods, this is why life expectancy is now falling. It's been falling in the United States for the last four years, not just because of diseases of despair, but also because of sepsis, just as the rats, diabetic complications, neurodegenerative disease. In Britain for the last three years, uh, sorry, and we're in 2021, five, five and four years now. And it will be coming soon to Germany, Ireland, Finland, Poland, Australia. And of course, it's starting to happen in Canada too, by the way, because that reflects the amount of ultra processed foods we eat. America's number one, 60%. Canada second, 55%. UK, which is the 51st state, third at 50.7%. And then you can see Ireland, Germany, Poland, and Finland and they're the countries that are the next most badly affected as the multinational companies drive their toxic foods across Europe from north to south and from west to east. In fact, down at the bottom there, the Mediterranean diet has been almost obliterated. It's disappearing rapidly, which is a shame because eating a Mediterranean diet is probably the healthiest thing you can do. It reduces the risk of all of these types of diseases by between oh, a third and even up to 50%. It's very, very protective indeed. But we know of one diet that was more protective and that was the diet that was consumed in England in the mid Victorian era, which is 1850 to 1900. Made possible by two singularities. The first of these, the agricultural revolution, which hugely increased agricultural productivity. Secondly, the industrial revolution, which created a transport system that could bring all of these fresh foods into the cities where people worked. And of course, they worked with their backs 
and with their hands. This was a blue collar society and it has been very carefully analyzed. They worked hard physically and not only did they uh, their labor, uh, the, the way in which they earned their living, <clears throat> but um, how did they get to work? Well, no taxis, no Ubers, no buses, no trains, no trams. They walked almost exclusively. Leisure, but most of that leisure activity, a lot of that was physical as well. There were no computers, no Game Boys, no mobile phones. And when you add up all the physical activity they were involved in, it's between 60 and 75 hours of physical activity a week. This is a society that is very well documented. So they're burning large amounts of calories, women between three and 4,000 calories a day, men between three and 7,000 calories a day. And yet, according to the photographs, they're all very, very slim because they're burning those calories in physical activity. What are they eating? Well, no ultra processed foods, very little processed foods at all, apart from bread and cheese and butter. Everything else that they're eating is basic produce. So lots and lots of vitamins, lots of minerals, lots of omega-3s, because at that time, wild salmon and oysters are the foods of the poor. Very little omega-6 because plant oils at that point in time had not been stabilized. Lots of fruits and vegetables. So a really good six to three ratio. And by that, I mean a very low one between two and three to one. And lots of polyphenols coming in from the fruits and vegetables. So they didn't have chronic inflammation. It's a really, really healthy diet. And that shows through in their life expectancy and health expectancy. Now, if you compare life expectancy between different societies, you have to compare the similar socioeconomic groups to make any sense out of this. Mid-Victorian era is primarily blue collar and it's the equivalent to um, C's and C and D's today, if you're using the rather old fashioned uh, social analytical parlance. So the mid-Victorian women has a life expectancy. They have a life expectancy of 73. 21st century working class women in 2006 had a life expectancy of 76. It's now down to about 75. So women have gained two years. And that's because in the Victorian era, women who were in a marital relationship would typically go through repeated cycles of pregnancy and childbirth for between 23 uh, decades, sometimes more. And that was very dangerous. Many of them died in childbirth. And so we can see from this that family planning and better gynecology and obstetrics have been medical triumphs of the 20th century. They have made things better for women. Look at men. Men have lost three years. Actually, it's now three and a half years. And so despite our so-called sophisticated medicine, our diagnostic procedures, our surgery, men have actually lost three and a half years of life expectancy. And we've lost a lot more health expectancy. On average, we spend the last 10% of our lives in a state of progressive medical dependency of progressively severe illness. The Victorians didn't. They did not age in the way that we do. Typically they retained full mental, sexual, physical health until the last weeks, if sometimes days before they died. They culturally, they didn't have a welfare society in the way that we would hope or expect to see today. They were sent when they were too old to work in the factories or the fields to an institution called the workhouse, which meant exactly what it said. And we know from the records that most of these people were able to work to pay for their upkeep until the last week or day or sometimes hours before they died. When they did die, they didn't die slowly and very expensively as we tend to do. They died very quickly and therefore very cheaply, which is why the mid Victorian society did not need to spend very much on healthcare because there was so much less degenerative disease. They lived as long as we do, and yet in that population, and we know this because we've looked through so many of the autopsy reports, there was 90% less cancer, heart disease, diabetes than we see today. And it's not just us who've seen these findings. This is another research group comparing causes of death in 1880 and 1997 in England and Wales. On the right, 1997, and you can see cancer, that's the black part of the column, and cardiovascular and circulatory diseases, the one above it, they account for mm, about 66% of deaths today. And that's quite typical. In 1880, those only caused 6% of deaths. 
And this data is telling us two things. It's telling us that about 90% of the chronic degenerative disease we see today is preventable, if you know how to do it. And it's telling us that in the Victorian era, that only 10% of those people who died of those conditions, that should ring a bell with you. Because if any of you ever ask a cardiologist or an oncologist or a neurogeriatrician, how many of your patients have strong genetic risk factors, they'll say about 10%. And so from these data, we believe that if you're eating a mid-Victorian diet and following that kind of a lifestyle, it is only the people with strong genetic risk factors who develop these diseases. Everybody else is protected. For the geeks and the scientists here, this is a quick breakdown of what was protective about the Victorian diet and what is so dangerous about ours in terms of cancer risk. So on the left, you have a whole series of risk factors that will increase or reduce the risk of cancer. Then you have the Victorians in the middle and we have us today over on the right. And it turns out that when you break down all of these different factors, every one of them is positive in the Victorian. Every one of them has been degraded in the 21st century citizen. So if a cancer cell were to emerge in the body of a Victorian, it has no chance of success. It would be like trying to take a match and setting fire to a green growing tree in the forest. In comparison, the 21st century victim, a cancer cell emerges in one of you. It has a much greater chance of success because all of our defenses against it, and we have many lines of defense, each and every one of them has been dismantled by the modern lifestyle, which is why our rates of cancer have increased tenfold. So let's look at a typical 21st century subject. And uh, let's call him, oh, I don't know, Mr. Trudeau. Anyway, this person is eating an ultra processed diet. I think he's stupid enough to be doing that. And he's eating a diet which contains a very high 63 ratio and no polyphenols. And that means that he has chronic inflammatory stress, which could show as an arthritic disorder. It could be coronary artery disease or the beginnings of liver disease. It could be asthma, chronic obstructive lung disease, neurodegenerative disease, depression, or migraine. All of these diseases have a strong inflammatory component. But he's also eating a diet which has been absolutely depleted of prebiotic fibers, which means that the microbiota, the microbes that inhabit his large bowel, are predominantly gram-negative, and therefore he has chronic inflammatory stress in his intestines as well, which may show up as IBS or IBD, or eventually uh, as one of a range of cancers which affect the gastrointestinal tract. This is someone who is very unhealthy. They're aging fast. Actually, you don't have to worry about Mr. Trudeau because the elites who take such good care of us and the people who are in charge of the major food companies don't eat ultra processed foods. I've spoken to enough of them to know that neither do they consume these products that they're happy to sell to us. They also don't let their children eat them either because they know exactly how dangerous they are. So let's rectify the situation by changing the six to three ratio and putting polyphenols back into the system, which we can do with balance oil, which will switch off inflammatory stress in most tissues, but doesn't have an hope of switching off the situation in the large bowel because there you need to add prebiotic fibers. If you're eating omega-3s and polyphenols, they're all absorbed in the small intestine. They don't get to the large intestine. There, what you have to do is to add prebiotic fibers and transform the microbiome to a pre-transitional profile, which means switching more of the microbes to being gram positive. When you do that, inflammation there stops as well. So what are these prebiotic fibers? Well, they're not food for us, they're food for the microbes that live in the large bowel. And there are those little things swimming around in green. And at the bottom of this picture are a row of colonocytes. They're the cells that line the large intestine. Now the green microbes are in the lumen of the gut because their preferred food is prebiotic fiber which enters the bowel, the large bowel, it comes in from the small intestine and it remains in the lumen. So these bacteria stay there and they eat these fibers, they break them down and they excrete metabolites, including butyric acid. Butyric acid, it's a little bit 
technical, but it's a powerful anti-inflammatory compound and it is very good at killing cancer cells. So this kind of situation where you're eating prebiotic fiber, you've got lots of these gram positive microbes, the green ones inside the colon, that is a very healthy environment because the conversation they are having with our colonocytes is don't be inflamed, don't be cancerous. This is how it should be. Now you switch to a modern ultra processed diet, the prebiotic fibers have gone. And so the good guys, the green gram positive bacteria are starved, they diminish, their place is taken by the red microbes, which are gram negative. The gram negative microbes like to eat mucin, which is the layer of mucus that otherwise protects the colonocytes. They degrade that mucus layer and come into direct contact with the colonocytes. And because gram negative cells are coated with lipopolysaccharide, which is a powerful pro-inflammatory compound, now you're in trouble. Now you have serious chronic inflammatory stress in the large bowel, causing problems locally and everywhere else in the body. What do you do about that? Simple, you put the prebiotics back into the diet where they always used to be, support the growth of the healthy bacteria, and they will then do their job. They'll calm everything down and they will start to remove the unhealthy gram negative bacteria. For the bacteriologists amongst you, we know that not all gram negatives are bad, not all gram positives are good, but this is a general truth. These are the types of fibers they like to eat. These are prebiotic fibers. This is one called FOS. It's a short molecule, so the bacteria break it down. Technically, they ferment it very quickly, which is why you can't use too much of this. So we add larger amounts of inulin, the same molecule, but larger, so a slower reaction. Larger amounts of this, beta-glucans, slower reaction. And this much more complex molecule is a resistant starch that we can get from green bananas. And now the reaction is very slow indeed. And you need all of these because once the, this mixture of prebiotic fibers enters the large intestine, because then we don't digest them, they pass through the small intestine intact. Once they emerge in the large bowel, it is the FOS, the very short, rapid fibers that start to transform your microbiome first. And they're very quickly used up, and then the inulin takes over, then the 1, 3, 1, 4 beta-glucans, then the resistant starch. And in this way, we transform the entire microbiome, moving it from gram-negative dominance to gram-positive dominance, moving it from being very pro-inflammatory to being anti-inflammatory. This is a traditional microbiome supported by a traditional diet, and it will restore you to traditional health. WHO backs this up. They say higher fiber intakes reduce early death by 30%, and that's how that breaks down. Very protective indeed. Uh, they say you should be eating a minimum of 30 grams of fiber a day, but you get more benefits if you eat more. The problem is hardly anybody eats enough. The average intake is only half the WHO minimum recommended dose. And of that, only a quarter is the prebiotic fiber. So their data clearly show that you should be eating at least seven grams of prebiotic fiber a day, if not more, I would recommend more than that. And we have designed Xenobiotic to give you twice that dose of this time-release blend of prebiotic fibers to restore a pre-transitional microbiome. Two other sources of chronic inflammatory stress in many people today, and one is abdominal or deep adipose tissue. These are pockets of fat that we build up inside the intestines, close to the heart, the liver, the pancreas. And this type of fat becomes infiltrated with macrophages, which break down the fat and start to produce very pro-inflammatory compounds, which is why this type of fat, apple-shaped fat, is considered to be rather bad for you. You can lose this fat by taking lots and lots of exercise, which some people are prepared to do, others aren't or can't. So we developed a different way of treating this, there are a group of fat soluble micronutrients, including tocotrienols, carotenoids, xanthophils, and lipid soluble polyphenols that get into the adipose tissue and switch off the inflammation. So that's another important thing that we can do to improve your prospects. But there's one more source of chronic inflammation that's very common, which is periodontal disease. You brush your teeth, spit into the sink and see a spot of blood, do not ignore it. This is actually something very serious because 
it has been associated with many other conditions, serious health conditions. If you have periodontal disease, which is chronic inflammation of the gums, you have dysbiosis in the mouth, the wrong microbes. They're producing bacterial toxins and inflammatory metabolites which pass into the brain through the olfactory nerve and appear to increase the risk of Alzheimer's, Parkinsonism and stroke. And because you're swallowing these compounds, this is also associated with an increased risk of other very nasty, complicated conditions. So this is something you should not just dismiss. When you see that spot of blood, this is a sign for you to do something important for your health. You could go to the dental hygienist and have the roots of your teeth scraped, which I absolutely hate doing. Luckily, we now have an alternative solution, which is derived from the ocean, not from the fish, but from the seaweed. Now, when you take seaweed fresh out of the ocean, the first thing you'll notice is how slippery it is. And that is because seaweeds are coated with fucoidans, which are the biological equivalent of Teflon. They're non-stick compounds. And when you eat the right kinds of seaweeds, then you absorb the fucoidans, they get into the blood, into the saliva, and they coat the roots of your teeth in the equivalent of Teflon. When that happens, the bacteria and the biofilm on your teeth simply fall away. First of all, the plaque disappears, and you can test this for yourself by using plaque disclosing tablets you can get from your dentist. And then after three weeks, two to three weeks, the tartar mineralized plaque falls off the roots of the teeth, inflammation stops, the gums stop bleeding, and some really interesting Japanese work shows that teeth which were starting to wobble build themselves back into the jaw. So this is being put into, not extend, but into a companion piece, which will go along with extend. It contains these fucoidans and some other really interesting compounds as well, stops the periodontal disease, and it gives you that feeling that your teeth have just been to the dental hygienist, that kind of slippery feeling, which I think you, you, uh, you probably know. And when that happens, we think that all the other risk factors go away as well. Now, I don't think it's necessary for everybody to get paranoid and to take all of these different things if you don't need them. So the best thing to do is to test yourself. Uh, there's a self-test, which is run through uh, a very well-known third-party laboratory in Oslo. It's uh, <clears throat> you prick your finger with a little pin, put a couple of drops of blood onto a filter paper, send it off in a special envelope. And then in a couple of weeks, you can go online with your own personal and private code and download your test result. And if you have a good test result, uh, I think the ways Encino works is they give you your, your money back. They repay the cost of the test and say, go away, stop bothering us because you don't need any of the products that we have to sell. If you get a bad result, we can give you advice on how to get a better ratio, either with diet or with supplements, or you can involve yourself with the program that we've developed to counter the post-transitional lifestyle, to counter the diseases of civilization. So chronic inflammation in the tissues, we can switch off very effectively using this mixture of omega-3s and lipophile, or more technically correctly, amphiphile polyphenols, very special polyphenols. In the gut, we can restore a pre-transitional microbiome using these blended prebiotic fibers. And in the deep fat and periodontal disease, we have Extend and its companion product, which is also designed, by the way, to restore proper nutritional status, to undo tight malnutrition, and to bring your nutritional profile up to the level that we see in the blue zones today. So it's a very systematic approach, a very simple approach. And we now have, I think, a library of uh, close to 600,000 of these test results, the, by far the largest of its kind in the world. And the biobanking community who are looking at the Zinzino population are seeing several things. Firstly, we have a lot of information, which is very useful to them. But secondly, the health of the people who are on this program is quite unlike the health of the communities around them. They seem to be extremely protected, extremely healthy. They maintain good health for, very, well, until very late in life. Um, now I'm 70 years old now, and my eyesight is as good as it was 20 years ago. My reflex speed is as good as it was 30 years ago. I can run 100 meters at about the same speed that I could when I left university. Having said that, I was never a very fast runner. 
but it is very clear that the aging process is malleable and that by doing certain things, you can choose to either accelerate it or slow it down. And we now have, I think, a very <clears throat> clear and comprehensible set of machinery that we can bring to play in order to achieve that. So I will now uh, stop sharing the screen and I don't exactly know how um, Doina wants to structure this, but maybe there's time for some questions and answers. Um, so Michael Kelso, you say absolutely none of this is true. I doubt you would know, but if you'd like to ask me a question specifically, uh, we could debate that. In fact, I welcome debate. Uh, do you? I asked him to unmute. Mm -hmm. So Michael, if you want to um, ask a question. Meanwhile. Meanwhile, uh, I will launch a poll mm -hmm. while people are uh, here and we uh, trying to see which one of you would like to ask uh, Dr. Paul Clayton uh, a question. So the, this poll, these polls are completely anonymous. So mm -hmm. <laughs> you can um, you can answer without uh, us uh, knowing who said what. Uh, sure. Well, there's a couple of questions in the text box, so I'll answer those in no particular order. Okay. Um, so is it, uh, is periodontal disease, is it a sign of brain damage? No, it isn't. Periodontal disease is not a sign of brain damage, but chronic periodontal disease is associated with an increased risk of Parkinsonism and Alzheimer's. And we think the reason why it, there is this association is because if you have this dysbiosis, this chronic inflammatory stress in the mouth, that various metabolites, uh, including something called alpha-synuclein and curl one these are names that are given to very specific metabolites and bacterial proteins, are able to move retrograde through the olfactory nerve into the brain. And they seem, they, they're actually very closely associated with neurodegenerative disease. So it's, we used to think, we weren't sure in the early days whether periodontal disease increased the risk of Hi, sorry, you're muted. Accidentally, I think. Okay. So we used to, we went, uh, in the early days, we weren't sure whether periodontal disease increased the risk of, de of neurodegenerative diseases or vice versa. We didn't know which way that association went or which way the causation went, if there was any causation. Uh, but some recent work that's been done in Japan shows very clearly that it is the gum disease that leads to the problems, the neurodegenerative problems later on. And actually a lot of the biochemical machinery that drives that, so that, that, uh, that association has been worked out. So it's not the plaque in the mouth that travels, it is the, the, the plaque is actually biofilm produced by microbes that are getting uh, into the gums, they're causing inflammation, they're releasing toxins, and it is those toxins and the inflammatory mediators that are getting into the brain that we think increase the risk of neurodegenerative disease. I'm, I'm just scanning to see if there's any more questions. Um, the requirement for fiber in the human diet is zero from Michael Kelso. Well, Michael clearly uh, doesn't know what he's talking about because there is an enormous literature uh, showing very clearly that fiber is absolutely essential. And the WHO meta-analysis, which is really a huge exercise in number crunching, uh, shows without any shadow of a doubt that if you have insufficient intakes of these types of fibers, you're increased uh, risk of early death shoots up by 30%. Um, so if Michael is capable of quoting data to the contrary, uh, I'd be very interested to hear it, but he is a distinct minority of one. The scientific community would not agree with that. Uh, what are the top 10 foods that you recommend eating? Um, you know, I don't really want to get into the 
business of recommending specific foods because everybody has different preferences, which are not only different from person to person, but they're different from region to region, from country to country. I would say it's um, a healthier thing that you can do uh, and a more important piece of information that I think I can give you is to say, well, just don't eat ultra processed foods. Ultra processed, according to the NOVA definition, these are foods which typically contain six ingredients or more. When you look at them, you can't actually tell what's in them because they've been so homogenized. If the label on the back of the pack says it contains emulsifiers, acidulants, stabilizers, these are all signs of ultra processed foods and you want to reduce them to a minimum. It's difficult because they're cheap, they're everywhere, because there's, uh, are Twinkies okay? Absolutely not. <laughs> you can plead your case if you want, but a Twinkie is very obviously an ultra processed food and those sorts of foods are associated with, with, with far worse health. So avoid ultra processed foods, stick to basic produce. And in many cases, that will mean taking some cooking lessons, learn how to cook, and how to work with basic foods, with basic produce once again. And if you don't take anything else away from this little presentation, that would be the single most valuable piece of information I think I could pass to you. Um, from Ada Marinescu, would balance oil help with the issues of the gut? Uh, yes, to some extent, but if there is a serious problem in the gut, I think it's very important that first you change the microbiome, you bring it back to a pre-transitional microbiome, which is gram positive dominant. For that, you need prebiotic fibers. That will stop a large part of the inflammatory stress in the large intestines. Once you've reestablished a healthy microbiome, at that point, you can start to use balance oil carefully. Um, because the, the balance oil is having an anti-inflammatory effect, but on the inner layers of the gut, not the outer layers. Uh, should we stay away from sugar and salt even with home cooking? Um, the pure meta study, which has just come out, shows really, really clearly that a diet which has a, an excessive glycemic load, which contains too much sugar, does have negative outcomes. And that was really mostly looking at cardiovascular endpoints, but there's actually quite a lot of evidence that a diet that is top heavy in sugar increases your risk of many other disease conditions as well. Um, glycemic index is important too, but reducing the overall glycemic load, I think is the most important thing that you can do. Uh, would you tell us what can trigger IBS and what should be done from the gut? Um, IBS is definitely associated with dysbiosis. And so I would say uh, balance oil and xenobiotic there, very simple uh, and very effective in many cases. If you live in a country that doesn't have xenobiotic yet, um, okay, sources for these different fibers, inulin, I think you can buy inulin in many countries. Now the inulin is quite good for some things, but it doesn't have the really long and really slow fermenting fibers. So I would combine that with oats. Oats contain the 1314 beta glucans. And if you can take the time and the trouble to make your own resistant starch, that would be a good thing to add as well. <coughs> so green bananas contain resistant starch ready-made, but you can make your own. For example, by um, roasting potatoes and then cooling them and then heating them again and cooling them again and heating them again, each time you go through the heat cool cycle, you change more of the starch from being digestible to fermentable. And so the, fire, the potato becomes more and more prebiotic. You're making more and more resistant starch. So those would be foods that you could consider if uh, you didn't have access to xenobiotic. Is the balanced oil recommended for diabetics? I think for diabetics, the very first thing you can do is cut down on your intake of sugars and starches and take more physical exercise. Um, there's a lot of studies that show that if you do that, you can, in many cases, cure your own diabetes. Balanced oil will help because it does improve insulin sensitivity a bit, but it would not be my uh, first recommendation. Okay, so I'm trying to keep up with everyone. Um, I, I just keep on coming back to that question. I think from Nina Corissa Ortiz, are Twinkies okay? <laughs> Nina, you must really like Twinkies, but Twinkies are a, a really good example of ultra processed foods. 
These are foods which have a long, long shelf life. I mean, when long life for the foods, not for you, the more you eat of them, the shorter your life will get. But food companies love them because they have a high profit margin uh, and they stay on the shelves forever. They don't get stale, but they're not good for you at all. Okay, um, any more questions? <laughs> No, it wasn't a stupid question. You know, if, if people are particularly fond of Twinkies. Okay, I'm going to let you get away with your Twinkies, but just don't eat too many of them. I mean, one a week is not going to do you too much harm. But it's when you start integrating ultra-processed foods into your lifestyle and are eating them for three meals every day, that is when you are going to start to run into serious trouble. Tin tomatoes, absolutely fine. They're not ultra-processed. The definition of a processed food, as opposed to ultra processed, is that when you look at it, you can tell what's in it. So tin tomatoes, you open the tin, you know they're tomatoes, you can still recognize them. They have not been ultra processed. Moderate beer intake is good for the soul. Well, I'm not, I don't know, I don't know anything about souls, but I think uh, moderate beer intake is not a bad thing. I'll go along with that. I'll let you have that too. <laughs> Oh, by the way, it should be um, beer that has not been ultra filtered, because if it has not been ultra filtered, in other words, if it still has a little sediment in it, it will contain these very valuable compounds called 1,3,1,6 beta glucans, which come from the yeast that was used to make the beer. And they have been shown to be very, very important immunomodulatory compounds. They increase your ability to fight off infections and reduce your risk of allergy. A glass of red wine, um, no, a glass of red wine is absolutely fine. Uh, the only types of alcoholic beverage that I think are really should be avoided are the spirits. So whiskey, vodka, gin, those are the types of drinks that you should avoid. Uh, they are carcinogens. If you combine them with tobacco, they are extremely, they are very carcinogenic. Um, but beer and wine are less damaging. And there is some evidence that moderate alcohol intake of beer and especially of red wine may actually be health neutral or possibly even a little bit health positive. White rice and pasta and bread, Paul. Um, okay, you can get away with eating more carbs if you're physically very active. And the reason I say that is that being physically very active means that you're soaking up the glucose that these starches are broken down into, you're soaking them up into your muscles and using them for fuel. So if you look at the old food pyramids that come from countries like Crete, the Cretan diet was known to be very heart healthy. If you look at that pyramid, the base is pasta and flour and bread products, baked products. If you're physically very active, you can eat these foods because all the sugar that's being poured into the bloodstream from eating those starches is taken up into the muscles. The, Bad combination is when you're eating lots of starch and you're physically very inactive because all the blood sugar, all the glucose that is being formed in the gut and pouring into the blood has got nowhere to go. Only the liver, and the liver is not a very good uh, uh, glucose reservoir. Yep, okay, and I, 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 mean, I, I teach this as well. I mean, it's a very different presentation. And that's really all about um, glycemic control, metabolic stress, and how to do how to manage that. But we didn't have time to cover that today. I, I just want to point out everybody that I opened uh, the mics, so uh, everybody, any, everybody can ask a question. If they unmute their mic. Do I do other seminars and webinars? And the answer is uh, yes, I do quite a lot of them. Hi, Paul. So like a better, um, I just, I just want to go back to your uh, slide saying that the 16th century lifestyle is actually better than the Mediterranean food diet. Oh, well, not um, 16th, not 16th. It was 19th century. <laughs> Sorry. The feudal system. <laughs> it's like, Oh, well, it's <laughs> feudal. It's very no, topical no. right now because we're clearly going back to a kind of neo-feudal society right as we speak. 
Right. I totally agree. That's such a hot topic right now, like neo feudalism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so apt. Um, I, I was I was writing about this 15 years ago. I could see it coming. Oh wow! I'd I'd love to see your article. I mean, if you have any articles on on it. Well, do you know my blog spot? Okay, cool. If you could link, if you could link it, I'd be really grateful. Okay, so it's just coming up in the chat box now, and it's. I think I always say there's something there to offend everyone. I simply go by the science, and I don't care whether it's politically correct or fashionable or not. For me, the science comes first, second, and third. So you you have here on the screens right on your screens line now, right now a list of books that Dr. Paul Clayton um, uh, wrote uh, through the years. Uh, probably the one to start with would be "Let Your Food Be Your Pharmacoutrition." It's very easy to read <laughs> for us <laughs> who are not uh, um, researchers or not scientists. And you also have here. Um, Dr. Paul Clayton's uh, blog. So you can take a picture of that if you want, or I can also send it in chat for you. Okay, more questions coming in. <laughs> um, interesting point from NREGS, cannabis strains dominate in CBD and very low in THC. Um, what did you actually mean by that, NREGS? I wonder if they mean like if that's good for the body or if you know anything about, about oh, okay. it. Okay, yes, yes, yes. I mean, this is an area that I have um, also written about. I've got a scientific paper coming out on this um, in August. Um, so CBD is interesting because it clearly has uh, some valuable anti-inflammatory properties. The problem with hemp derivates is that the legal situation is actually quite varied in different parts of the world. And if you're dealing with a multinational company, which in this case we are, uh, it's very difficult for them to arrive at a position that is safe according to the regulators in all the territories where they operate. So there are other compounds which actually do all the same things that CBD does. And one of those is uh, palmitoyl ethanolamide, otherwise known as PEA. And there are some very interesting forums around this at the moment. If you ever see something called Levagen Plus, this is a very highly bioavailable form of palmitoyl ethanolamide. And it's really, really interesting. It's, a, it, 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 it's like an endocannabinoid and it does have really interesting anxiolytic and analgesic effects. It's uh, what the body uses itself to initiate healing. And it's a endogenous response to damage. For those who know about these things, it's known as an autocoidal substance. Um, there is another substance called beta carophylline, which seems to work in a very similar way. It's in that family and you can derive it um, from uh, hops and from clove. And there is a tropical plant, which is a much higher concentration of it, and which is typically used as a source. Again, there are different regulatory situations in different parts of the world. And you know, from this, you can tell that regulators are not particularly scientific. They get same, given the same data, and they come to very different conclusions in different territories, because frankly, many of the positions they arrive at are political rather than scientific. Um, so because of the, CBD and the beta carophylline issues, they still have to be resolved at the moment. The one compound that I know of that is universally applicable and accessible is palmitoyl ethanolamide. Uh, Moringa is, would, would be my sort of fifth or sixth choice. It, it just doesn't give you the same benefits. Where can we get the PEA? Um, your search term here, I'm just typing it in now. Levagen Plus. Um, it is manuf it, 
I think if you simply use that as a search term on eBay, you will probably find a couple of supplements that contain it. And uh, um, it's very good as an acute anti-inflammatory. It's not something necessarily you want to use long-term. It's just too expensive uh, really to do, to use in that way. For that, something like balance oil uh, will give you much more cost-effective more uh, and long-term protection. Nobody. Let's see the other other questions. Okay, about the test, um, the balance test. Actually, there, there was one other question. Um, someone wanted to know what was the plant, the plant that it comes from. Uh, it's called copaiba. So that's your source. Uh, is there a test that I mentioned earlier? Yes. The, um, the test is called the balance test. And I don't have access to this myself, but I think people in Zinzino can get it for you. It's a home use blood test. It's based on a pinprick, a bit like uh, the way we used to measure blood sugar. And you send that away to um, Vitas Laboratories, which is a WHO affiliated lab in Oslo which was spun out of the University of Oslo. And they will do a full spectrum analysis showing the profile of lipids in your erythrocyte cell membranes. Um, they're probably the best in the world at doing that. Um, a question from Michael Kelso, <laughs> who missed the last 20 minutes. What diet is recommended? I think very simply cut out ultra processed foods would be uh, the most important thing that you could possibly do. And then once you've done that, uh, more fruits and vegetables, uh, cut out sugar, um, protein, uh, animal protein is absolutely fine. The mid Victorians, for example, ate huge amounts of animal protein and had far less heart disease and cancer than we did, but it depends how you cook it. This is a question I get asked a lot. Um, when you cook animal proteins at high temperatures, you produce carcinogens. They're called cooked meat carcinogens. And so grilling, roasting, these are not very good ideas, although they taste good. The Victorians, uh, most of them experienced fuel poverty. So typically they cooked low and slow, which almost always meant stewing. And of course, if you stew meats, like a slow cooker would be the equivalent today, then the temperature never rises above 100 degrees. And if you cook with onions in your casserole pot, they contain sulfur compounds that slow down the formation of these uh, cooked meat carcinogens even more. So if you like meat, then this would be the way to cook it in a way that doesn't risk put your health uh, at risk in any way. When it comes to inulin, should it preferably be in a powder form or a capsule? Makes no difference. Um, Michaela Morel balance test 11.4 to 1 and second 2 to 1. First of all, Michaela, your first test was really good because the, I don't know where you're based. If you're a North American, the average in North America is 25 to 1. So you're already better than average, but you're still above 5 to 1. And that's where chronic inflammation starts at 5 to 1 and above. So you really want to dive down below that. The Scandinavian Council of Health Ministers recommends lower than 5 to 1. Um, the people who are really expert in this would say, well, better to be below three to one. And I usually try and stay between two and three to one. So you're now in the right place. You won't have chronic inflammation with that ratio. Do I recommend coconut oil uh, in moderation? I don't have a problem with it. I don't think it's a wonder nutrient, uh, but it's uh, probably healthier. It's certainly healthier than trans fats and it's certainly healthier than the omega-6 rich plant oils. Will we be able to test more than our omega-3 ratio in the future? We already can. We already test uh, a, a whole range of different fatty acids in your cell membranes. And you can see that if you go into the test in detail, the test is being expanded and 
more analytes will be added to it in the very near future. <clears throat> ah, interesting. Michaela was using omega-3, but it was a different brand. <clears throat> then in that case, you are absolutely average. We know that people who don't eat fish, who don't eat um, uh, uh, fish oil at all, have ratios of about 25 to one. If you eat a standard fish oil, it will bring your ratio down to about 10 to one, but that's not enough to stop inflammation, which is why fish oil doesn't work. If you eat oily fish or use balance oil, your ratios will come down to below five and very often to two to three. And that's when the magic starts to happen. How do you find the balance test in the USA? Um, Elisa, I honestly, I personally, I can't help you. I don't know where to find one in the USA, but if you know someone from uh, Zinzino, they could, I think they would be able to get one for you. The last time I looked at this, um, I think the price, uh, Doina, will you, will you contradict me if I'm wrong? I think that they're about $90 uh, for the test, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah, there are different prices in Canada and USA, but it's around, uh, yeah, between 90 and 130. Oh, okay. Yes, for a, um, just one test. Okay, well, I mean, when, I think, how does it work? When you, when you buy the first test, do they then give you a second one for free after four months? Is that how it works? Uh, it depends. If you uh, subscribe and you get uh, on, uh, on a six month um, term uh, yeah. program, then after four months, you get uh, the second test for free. Okay. And you, test, you test to see if in four months, um, the balance oil and the products that you are taking uh, had any effect on on your ratio. So, okay. Well, I wasn't sure about that, but I think that's quite a good arrangement. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Correct, my uh, Michaela. It's ninety-five. Yeah, I think in Canada it's one twenty-nine. 129. <clears throat> okay, all right. I think that people have had enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, well, we are here for one hour and almost a half. Um, hey, there is another question. What's your favorite oil to use? <laughs> um, I don't like taking any of the oils. I don't like drinking oil. Um, I know I've seen the advertisements coming out of Scandinavia and it shows young, beautiful people drinking oil and showing every signs of enjoying it. Well, possibly. I am, I, I don't think it, any of them taste fantastic. They don't taste bad, but I wouldn't drink them for pleasure. Uh, so what I do is um, I will drink a mouthful of oil and then wash it down with something better. Hi, Paul. Sorry, I meant like cooking. Um, what what oil do you like to use in cooking? <laughs> okay, sorry, that wasn't at all clear. Um, okay, I will cook with olive oil, but that has a low smoke point. So there's a very old trick you can use to make sure the olive oil doesn't smoke. Whenever you use olive oil, put a couple of drops of water in the frying pan, uh, if you're frying, that is. And the, the water will bubble and boil. And as it boils off, it actually keeps the temperature of the olive oil low. Once those drops of water have disappeared, put a few more in so that there's always water in there and the olive oil is always being kept cool. Uh, it'll still be at a temperature where you can cook. Um, awesome. That's really awesome. I didn't know either how to cook oh, with olive oil. That's, <clears throat> <laughs> that, that's, an, that's an old uh, Italian trick. And I mean, I've traveled, I've, I've lectured and, uh, and taught at universities in 60 or 70 countries. In every country where I go, I like to learn how to cook some of the local dishes. So I, I learned that trick in Italy. And I've, I've learned how to cook Indian food, Thai food, and I, I bring all those home and I, I, I practice them. I mean, the, the food is so diverse. 
and it is subculturally important. And I don't really want to be in a position to say, look, these are the 10 best foods. You all have your favorites. You all know what you uh, what is produced locally, what is best grown locally. And that was what we traditionally always used to eat. And those diets, the homegrown diets are usually pretty good. They may not be perfect, but they're certainly much better for you than the modern ultra processed diet. Uh, um, I, I have a question. Oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, Paul, does that speak to kind of like um, choosing the 100 mile diet being better than like the other diets? Sorry, what, what diet was that again? Oh, just like the 100 mile uh, diet, which is like oh, you grow up yes. around you. Well, of course, it depends where you live. Um, if you live in um, the center of Los Angeles, that might not work. Or if you lived in the Sahara Desert, <laughs> I'm not sure how well that would work either. Uh, but as a general principle, basically what that does mean is you're going to cut out ultra processed foods. So yeah, it's a reasonably good guiding principle. My question is uh, rela related to the genetically modified uh, uh, produce, produce. Like we have a lot in Canada and it seems that um, in North America is probably the same situation, the whole uh americas what do you think about these because mm. <laughs> are they okay. good for us i mean because we are trying to eat uh healthy but mm. if they are genetically modified what how would they impact our our uh body i'm very cautious about this because i'm not convinced that there is enough good long-term safety data uh, but I don't think there's enough information yet to be able to say with conviction either that they're all healthy or they're not healthy at all. I'm cautious. I try to eat ungenetically non-modified foods where that's possible. Thank you. Well, uh, I have a... One last poll, if nobody has other questions. Um, um, thank you so much, Paul, for taking time to answer so many questions. And that really like amazingly scientifically grounded uh, presentation. That was super cool. Um, science, and... science is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, on your website, do you have like a sign-up form where we can subscribe to your future lectures or? Um, I think, I don't run that blog site. I have some friends in Lithuania who are doing that and they've told me that they're going to add that. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, I know that's... This... Sorry. Sorry, on. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'll email the website and see if I can get on a list to um, get updated with your work. Um, this was really awesome and I just wanted to thank you for this. Well, thank, thank you and thank all of you for attending. I appreciate your time. Right, but it must yeah, be getting so. late. It must be <laughs> very late for many of you. So go home, go to bed, get some sleep. <laughs> Okay, thank you very, very much, uh, uh, Dr. Clayton. As you can see from the polls, uh, this session was very useful. I think we are our hunger for information in, wha in what um, is important for our life and how, how our lives are, are f it seems, are falling apart now. <laughs> so we need to to get back to our tables and our kitchens and uh, revisit the diet, but not also the diet. I think we need, it, we need also to take the supplements and get into a better balance with omega-6 uh, and omega-3 and then start eating well. All right. Well, good <laughs> night, everyone. Bye-bye.